In 1987, a groundbreaking album was released that fused hard rock, psychedelia, and punk to create a sound that was truly electrifying. With its raw energy, mystical lyrics, and captivating hooks, this album influenced a generation of musicians and became a cult classic. <laughs> Let's explore this iconic vinyl masterpiece. Hi, I'm Robert John Hadfield, vinyl junkie and garbage pit of useless information. And before we get started, I'm going to ask you to click on the like button, follow the channel, but most important, leave your own memories and insights in the comments. And speaking of classic media, if you have old audio and videotapes, recordings of your kids, families, etc., just sitting in your garage or closet wasting away, or if you know someone who does, you need to convert those things to digital before they disintegrate. Visit audiomover.com to get your audio and videotapes transferred into a permanent digital format. Okay, the album we're gonna talk about today, I am so excited to talk about. It is, of course, if you hadn't figured out from all the puns in the introduction, this is the album Electric by The Cult. In my opinion, this is one of the great rock albums one of the greats, one of the greatest ever made is this album right here. And when you look into who produced it and the background of this band, it, it, it's, it's no wonder this thing became such a masterpiece. When I was a teenager, this was back in 1987, I got tickets to go see Billy Idol in concert. And there was this girl that I really liked named Shannon. And I'm not so sure she cared much for me though. But I had tickets to go see, go see Billy Idol. And so I asked Shannon if she wanted to go see Billy Idol with me. And, and of course, Billy Idol was huge at the time. This was what, 1987. Billy Idol was huge. But more importantly for her, the cult was opening up for Billy Idol. Now, I had no idea who the cult was, but I really liked Billy Idol. And I was excited to go to this concert because I love Billy Idol. And so anyway, I got Shannon, we went to the show and she was excited to see the cult and I knew nothing at all about them. And so the, the lights go down, or so yeah, the lights go down, you know, the stage lights come on and here's the cult. And I was absolutely just blown away by what I saw on that stage because here you have this tall, kind of thin guy wearing all black. Of course, this is Ian Ashbury wearing all black, top to bottom, this long black hair. And he's just standing there like this, holding that microphone. And then you've got flanked these two different guitarists playing these big, thick, hollow body Gretsch guitars. <clears throat> and this ACDC guitar sound is coming out of them. They're whipping their hair around. And it was just awesome. I mean, it was one of the most awesome things I've ever seen. There's Ian Ashbury standing on that stage. And like I said, I didn't even know who this guy was. And I'm watching him up there and he's standing there holding this microphone. I remember one time he moved a little bit and the cable got caught around one of the monitors. And he looked over to the side of the stage like, get your ass out here and fix this. I mean, it was that type of attitude. It was so crazy cool. This little <laughs> roadie runs out and moves the cable. But he just had this presence, this charisma, I'm talking about Ian Ashbury now, that was just awesome. And then of course you have Billy Duffy, Duffy, who has this short hair and once again, this massive hollow body guitar. And you're looking at, we're looking at this on the stage. And then you're hearing ACDC is what it sounded like coming off the stage. And it was just like, what is going on here? And then Shannon, who actually was into the cult because of the previous album, is looking at him like, is this the same band? Because when you, when you look at the band prior, or the album prior to this one, and this one, it really was like two completely different bands. And so then, of course, they at one point sang the song, She Sells Sanctuary, which is the one Shannon knew about, and then, then she was like, okay, yeah, yeah, this is really the same band. And, but they were just awesome. And it was, it was life altering in the sense that the next day I had this album. It blew me away so much. I went to the record store and picked this thing up and I never looked back. And after getting this one, of course I had to keep buying more stuff. So then I bought the album right before this one, which was called Love. And if you've never listened to Love, even though the sound is very, very different, Love is a great album. 
And they were really, you know, they were this British band and they were more like, more like a goth band. And this is part of what the, the part of what made them so interesting was that this music sounded like just ACDC hard rock, which is just always kind of awesome. But then they looked like this. You know, you remember, this is 1987 with the hair bands and, and all the rock had this different, you know, the spandex and, you know, all this other stuff that everybody was kind of falling into. And then you had this, this, what is this? It made no sense the way they were presenting themselves. I mean, there's Ian Ashbury, that long black hair with this, with this, what, cap on, this fur hat? Billy Duffy with this short blonde hair, uh, Looks a little bit like he could be in the Stray Cats. The same thing with the drummer. Then the, the bass player, he's got this almost Euro pop. Hey, I, it just, anyway, it just didn't make sense to those of us that were, that were paying attention or listening to music or, or anybody that was into it at that time. This was, and it was part of the mystique of what made them so interesting and so great was their presentation style. And this album, you look at the cover and this didn't look like anything else that was out at the time. This artwork, the way they wrote the cult, the way, the, you know, electric, and then the, the pictures of these guys. And then when you look it up, let's, let's actually flip it over and look. And then once again, look at these pictures. Why? What? I thought these pictures were so cool, but, but what am I looking at? Once again, think of the time. This didn't fit in with anything. It was so unusual. And then the songs, the songs were so, so amazing. This album starts out with the song Wildflower. And when you hear that song, when you hear those opening chords, you know you're in for something amazing. That, just that powerful, rocking, just driving, gah, 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 gah. oh man. And then the drums kick in. And Ian Ashbury, yeah, you, pure a wild honey child. I'm out of control. I mean, oh man, it was awesome. His voice just soared. There's nobody that sounds like Ian Ashbury. And then as soon as, as soon as Wildflower's over, peace dog, peace is a dirty word. Oh man. <laughs> this album was so great. And then Lil Devil, all this stuff had this just ACD, driving ACDC sound. And that was, come on little devil. It was so great. And Aphrodisiac Jacket. I remember a friend of mine that I was turning on to this album. I pointed the name of that song. I said, how can a band not be awesome that has a song named Aphrodisiac Jacket? What is that all about? And the way he sings, Aphrodisiac Jacket, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. Electric Ocean is a great song. Bad Fun is a great song. King Contrary Man. And then, of course, a song that everybody's familiar with, Love Removal Machine. Talking about the love remover, talking about love removal machine. It was, it was one of the big songs off this album. And I'll tell you, you know, years later, I was playing in a band and, and we actually took two of the songs that we had in our set, it was a cover band, off of this album. And every time we played, we played Wildflower and Love Removal Machine, every single time we played these songs, Dance Floor Filled. It was just, there's some, so much energy and power in these songs. It was just amazing. And then, of course, they did a cover tune on this from Steppenwolf, Born to be Wild. Now, some people hated what they did with this. I thought it was pretty cool. It was their own little kind of straight-ahead rock and roll twist on Born to be Wild. And then Outlaw and Memphis Hip Shake, the, this whole album from start to finish, everything on it was good. And And part of it was... Who produced it? And the guy that produced this album is a guy named Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin was actively trying to take sounds from Led Zeppelin and ACDC. He was trying to do it. You know, Rick Rubin had been, he'd produced like the Beastie Boys License Deal. I mean, he helped write the song Fight for Your Right to Party. I mean, he produced things like Run DMC, Public Enemy, you know the song, this was after, but you remember the song Mother by Danzig? He produced that. And, and you can tell because it has this same type of, of approach, this straight ahead rock sound. But Rick Rubin, when he came in here and started working with them, 
they they took that sound that they developed on the album prior to this one, Love, and they almost threw it out. And it was like they started over as a band. And Rick Rubin, from the stories I heard, he would literally sit in the studio and they would break out ACDC and Led Zeppelin songs and listen to the guitar tones and listen to the drum tones and actively try to recreate it in the studio for this album. And... And it's partly why when a lot of us heard this album for the first time, we started thinking that sounds just like ACDC. Well, there's a reason for that because he was trying to get that ACDC energy and that ACDC sound. And that's what you got from this. And it's partly what made this thing so great. And then when you open this up, once again, same thing, look at these pictures. The, the, this, is, this is what a great record was all about. The, the album, of course, was awesome. The music was great, but the packaging. You start playing this album, and of course, you start looking at the pictures. You'd start, you, you, you know, Wildflower comes on, and you open this up, and you start looking at these guys. And here's Billy Duffy, like I talked about, these big hollow body guitars that they would play on stage. There's Ian Ashbury with that. And this is kind of back in the more goth look. Look at this. This does not look like what the, you expected to come out of this album. This is not what it was supposed to sound like when you look at these guys. All across this, this, this made no sense to so many of us. And then here's the other part here. Look at these awesome pictures. This was so cool. Just absolutely loved these guys and watching them in concert. And then the background with all these bullets and gears and things, this was awesome, awesome packaging. And it made the album that much better when you had this type of thing to look at while you listened to the album. It was, it was they were sending a message through the pictures, through the organization, through the artwork, and this art that's here on the front. It was just absolutely, I, I thought this was one of the, one of the great packagings, <laughs> packagings that's ever come out. And then when you break out the, the album itself, here you have the song list, uh, the songs and the lyrics, and this, uh, this blue inner sleeve. And then once again, here's all the, the songs and the lyrics there. But this, this album, I had a religious experience with this album once. So I, I went to that concert, of course. And, you know, let's, before I talk about that, let's just go through these members really quickly. Of course, here's, here's Ian Ashbury. Ian Ashbury was just this monster presence. There was something about him. There was something about that long black hair. There was something about that voice that had this, it was pure and yet it was raunchy and loud. And it just, it was just absolutely incredible. Billy Duffy, who was, who was the main guitar player. And, and these two guys really are the cult. They're the, the pair that writes the music and they're, they're the creative force behind this band. But Billy Duffy was just, uh, was just absolutely um, an amazing guitar player. And it was just raw energy. And that's what made him so amazing. It wasn't that he was flash and speed and all that other stuff. It was the creativity. It was the energy. It was the presentation. If you listen to the song Wildflower and listen to his solo, it is perfect in its imperfection. It sounds like a human being playing raw, gritty rock and roll. It's part of what makes Angus Young so great is because it's not this perfectly polished, it, it has what the electric guitar almost is supposed to have. And it's got that raw human energy just pouring out of it. And Billy Duffy has that. And that's partly what makes this music, when you put these two guys together, what makes it so great. Now the bass player, this is a guy named Jamie Stewart. Now, he'd been with the cult. He was on the album Love, and he was on this album. And he, it wasn't long after, he, he, he's not with the band anymore. He actually left the band. Uh, when they did this tour, and it's hard for me, I remember that when I saw them, they were a five-piece band, and then I got the album, and I saw this, and I go, this doesn't even seem like, is this really what I was watching the other night? Well, he actually, apparently on that tour, and this made more sense once I figured this out, was actually, instead of playing the bass, actually started playing the guitar, and they got another bass player to come in and, and play the bass. So he had, take, at least on the tour, taken over guitar duties, but he, he left the band, and 
I, I think it was just to go have a family <laughs> and a normal life. And anyway, it was after, it was sometime after this album came out and after the tour. I mean, I can't remember if he played on Sonic Temple or not. I think he might have, and then, and then, he, was, then he was gone. I'm not, don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% positive. I'm going to have to go back and look. And then, of course, you had Les Warner. Les Warner is the drummer, and he, this was, this was the only album that he was on. And he played on this album, he played on the tour, and then, and then that was it. And he was, the drumming, though, that he executed on this album was just awesome, legendary, amazing stuff. And he still, he still plays, I think he's based down in Las Vegas, and is a session drummer and plays in a couple of bands down there. But anyway, he's, he's just, at least on this album, he was just amazing. Now, I had a religious experience with this album once. I was... As some of you know, I was a professional musician in a former life when I was a younger guy. And we had some songs. I was based in Salt Lake City, and we had some songs that actually ended up in some movies. And so we had a couple of record companies that wanted to visit with us. I'm putting this in context so you understand why, what was going on. So <clears throat> we needed to make a trip to Los Angeles to visit with a couple of these record companies. Well, when I say we, it was me and my attorney, which is important to this story. Our band's attorney and I were going to go down and spend a week in L.A. to go visit with different record companies. So rather than flying, we decided to rent a car. And we rented a, this was 1994, we rented a 1994 white convertible Mustang to make the trip in. And it was just, I, I love Mustangs, and it was just a really extremely cool car. And we left late in the afternoon, and, and if you didn't know this, Salt Lake to Los Angeles, I-15 goes the entire way. So you can just get on I-15 and go all the way to Los Angeles from, from Salt Lake. And you drive down through southern Utah, you do a cut through Arizona, through a little canyon, and then you head out, you go through Las Vegas, and then it's just open road. You know, there's, there's kind of like being out in the desert through parts of this drive. And I remember as we're making this drive, it was late at night, it was dark, it was summer, so it was hot outside. And we put the top down in this Mustang, and I was driving, and we were trucking down this road. And it was this hot desert night. And, you know, the canopy above us of stars and and the, the smell of the desert and the warm air blowing and man it was and it was dark everywhere except for our headlights and my attorney reaches down in his bag and he pulls out this album but on cassette and he goes you want to listen to the cult and i thought you know other than playing a couple of these tunes live fairly regularly i hadn't listened to this album in a long time and so i was like yeah yeah so he he threw this cassette tape in and we turned it up as, as loud as that thing would go. And that opening guitar riff -na 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 -na, from Wildflower started. And I was transformed. It was this absolutely religious experience. I mean, here we are driving, just trucking down this road in a white convertible Mustang out in the middle of the desert the hot air, the wind, the, the, the sky, the stars, all of it. It was so amazing. And then this just blaring as we're trucking down the freeway. It was absolutely amazing, except for the fact that I was there with an attorney. <laughs> I remember trucking down that road thinking, this is one of the most amazing experiences of my life and also one of the most disappointing experiences of my life because who am I sharing this moment with? This religious experience with some of the most incredible music ever recorded and I'm st sitting next to this oaf attorney. <laughs> I was a nice guy. I liked him. He was a cool dude. But in a moment like that, that's not who you want to be with. You want to be, you, you picture yourself trucking down the road with some beautiful woman and experiencing this incredible, almost religious experience with somebody like that. And anyway, it was, it was really, really, other than 
that one missing piece, one of the most amazing nights of my life. And it was because of this. It was because of this incredible, incredible music. And if you've never listened to this album, or if it's been a while, get it out. This is the kind of thing that transforms you. And a lot of you know this. Music has that kind of power to take you back to feelings and experiences and a different time of your life. A time that, that might have been happier, a time that might have been more difficult, a time, but you still have those memories that get, that get brought back up because of these sounds. And to listen to something like this and the energy that comes pouring out of this music that literally transforms you, that takes you to another place, that gives you, that gives you strength. Think about that when you were a young person. What did this stuff mean to you? You know, I remember this stuff, this album, would provide energy and motivation and courage. That's what this stuff meant to us back then. You know, these people would put out these artistic expressions through music, and then we would, we would use these things in some ways to, to catapult our own lives, to find, to find strength, to find solace, you know, maybe you were having some difficulties with your parents or a bully at school or, or, you know, all kinds of different things that you were experiencing as a teenager. Being a teenager kind of sucked. It was tough. And we had this, though. We had this. And it was part of what made owning an album so important. Not just listening to something through headphones and it's in this... It wasn't like that. It was that I had this thing. I owned this. I knew that this music was sitting on my shelf right there. That I had access to it any time and I could pick it up and I could touch it and I could feel it. And for some reason it spoke to us even more just because of that. Like we were invested in this and this was now then a part of us. And to be able to sit there and just know that that music was sitting there on the shelf. That you had this thing that you could turn to whenever you needed to. That really was what it was like for a lot of us. I mean, I was kind of a nerdy, goofy kid when I was a teenager. And it wasn't easy. And to be able to have stuff like this that you could turn to. And now to be able to pull this stuff out. To pull this record out and look at this and feel this experience of what it was like owning this at the time. What it was like putting the needle on. What it was like as that music started coming off and the energy or the motivation or the courage or the solace or whatever it did. It was really that important. It was really, really that important to a lot of us. And it's probably one of the reasons that you see the resurgence of this stuff today. It's like we've lost it. We were missing something. And even kids today have a, a desire for ownership, to, to, to have this thing that, that represents their feelings, that represents th th this thing that, that helps them, that encourages them, that gives them motivation, whatever, but they want to own it. They want to have that physical thing to hold on to. And somewhere along the way, we lost that. And collectively, I think all of us feel it. And this isn't just some old guy rambling on and on. I mean, maybe it kind of is. But there was something to it. Having this physical representation. This physical representation of your feelings. This physical representation of your concerns. This physical representation of something that gives you courage. Something that gives you strength. That's what this stuff meant to us. Hey, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe to the channel. And as I said earlier, if you have old audio and videotapes from your past, from your history of your family and kids and things like that, they need to be preserved. And go to audiomover.com. Audiomover is a company that takes actually all your old stuff, your, your own memories, and converts it to digital so you won't lose it. So go to audiomover.com. It's a great way to support us if you like the stuff that we're doing here. Anyway, with that, have a fantastic day.